So I'm an IR in uh, Cambridge, and I suppose uh, our centre, um, which is a transplant centre as well, uh, we started our ablation programme probably like many others nearly 20 odd years ago. And uh, what we found, um, you know, as many centres have, was that there was an increase in number of requests for ablations over time. And this was driven by the clinical evidence, the data, establishment within guidelines, but crucially also driven by the presence of IRs in the tumour board meetings. And that's a critical point that has to happen. Um, of note, uh, during the COVID pandemic uh, in our centre, we found the surgeons were no longer able to operate because there were no beds for the patients to go to, but we were able to carry on doing ablation. And uh, in fact, we started to move to day case ablation for certain selected patients, which we had not really previously done. So the challenges as alluded to in the introduction there are uh, the difficult lesion either with ultrasound or CT. What do you do if you can't see the lesion or if you can't reach the lesion? And of course there's a variety of different approaches which people will have tried. In our center we tried all of these with uh, varying degrees of success. I wouldn't say they were great to be honest with you. And of course, the critical point here is that there's no way, if you're using ultrasound, of assessing whether or not you've completed treat, completely treated the tumor. Our center had about 18% uh, local recurrence rates um, with ultrasound guidance alone, and it's higher in other series in the literature. And of course, it makes it difficult with ultrasound, multiple lesions, et cetera, because of the snowstorm effect. So we felt we needed a more standardized and sort of reproducible approach and the ability to treat more complex lesions. So this is the CAS1IR system, which I, I first encountered actually at Circe in 2017. And it consists of the workstation on wheels on the right-hand side uh, with two video monitors and two, with two screens and a, and a video camera. Also has a patient fixation set, which is a board with a, a vacuum mattress uh, to immobilize the patient. It has the instrument set, which has a mechanical arm, which enables you to move the uh, device, the needle, to where you want to go, and a tracking uh, a needle in that instrument set. And finally, there's a set of consumables, which are essentially the stereotactic markers uh, required for this system. So the workflow is the patient is under G8. They come into the CT scanner. They have a CT scan. You can either use CT or MR, um, which I'll come to. Um, you plan a trajectory for your needle, and the system will help guide you to place the needle where you want it to go. You then do your ablation. And then this obviously is a critical step that we'll talk about, the uh, validation of the ablation zone. And uh, the workflow, therefore, is relatively standardized and homogeneous, uh, which hopefully will lead to, lead to reproducible outcomes. So this is a short video demonstrating it. That's the placement of the stereotactic markers. You can see the patient is uh, asleep in the CT scanner. There's the monitors. Uh, which you drape. You then do a CT, you mark the tumor, and uh, you then use the software to uh, segment the tumor for you. And then we come to this relatively critical juncture, which is the margin. So you select your margin, you can choose the size of the margin you wish to have around the tumor, and um, you can, depending on what tumor it is and what level of margin you want, the yellow circle will show that on the screen. You then pick the device that you're using, um, and in this case, it's a microwave probe. And the ma major manufacturers have their probes loaded into this software, so this now predicts what the ablation zone will be for that particular probe. So next, you attach the mechanical arm to the uh, patient fixation device, and you have the uh, needle tracking um, instrument here. The video camera now sees the I'll just pause that there. The uh, video camera sees the aiming device, and of course it sees the stereotactic markers and the tumor. So you end up with this uh, rather nice bullseye type appearance as you move the mechanical arm. And when you get close to what you're projected or what you were aiming to uh, do from your uh, trajectory, uh, you get this uh, satisfying uh, sort of bullseye appearance. You then fix the arm in place there and you just push the needle in the distance that is prescribed. So after you've done that, you then do an unenhanced CT scan, and you then perform what we call uh, verification. 
and the instrument now uh, will show you whether or not you have reached the desired place that you had planned for. And in this case, you can see that the green ablation zone is fractionally further than what was originally planned. And if you look to the right-hand side of the screen, it will actually tell you how far you've gone in. And in this case, we've gone um, three millimeters further than uh, intended. And so you can model what pulling back three millimeters would look like. The green ablation zone moves. And once you're happy with the position, you then proceed to doing the ablation. So this was the uh, first case, or one of our very early cases, and this was a patient with a single colorectal liver metastasis, small, near the edge of the liver, would be good for resection potentially, but uh, the patient refused open surgery because it had a bad time after his uh, primary was resected. And uh, I came across this case that was, and the problem in here was that the lesion was invisible on ultrasound, but was also invisible on CT. And so, uh, we were able to use the cassination system to import an MR from the patient's uh, records into the system and then fuse the MR with the CT. And so the lesion which was previously invisible on CT, you're now able to target using MR fusion and then it's a relatively simple ablation. I must say it's interesting being at Circe because uh, one of the things that happens is you meet a lot of people who you haven't met before. and. Uh, not just in the conference center, but outside. So last night I was uh, chatting to an Italian IR who I hadn't met previously, who works in a large volume center, and he was telling me about the problems that they have had with the so-called disappearing lesion, the lesion that they identify um, on preoperative planning, but because of chemotherapy disappears and shrinks away. And I said to him, well, you know, MRCT fusion potentially is an answer to that particular problem. I hope he's here now. <laughs> So we come to the issue about the margins. And uh, what we know, of course, is that margins are really important in reducing tumor recurrence. But how can you be certain um, of the assessment of this? And what we're really looking for is the so-called A0 ablation, which is similar to what the surgeons look for in their R0 sections. You need a margin. Definitely needs to be more than five millimeters. Um, and of course, we're limited at the moment, if you're doing these in the CT scanner, to conventional assessment, which is eyeballing and looking at your pre and post uh, scans. There are problems with this, not least of which is interreader variability. So you can see there's, there's a huge number of cases, a huge discrepancy in, in what happens when you try and evaluate just by looking at it. And this was an interesting paper where they looked at um, uh, a number of uh, radiologists or interventional oncologists of different levels of expertise. And they found that the results were not very good in terms of uh, assessment overall. But very interestingly, they found that even the expert users, the people who had been doing more than 50 ablations using CT, they were no better than the people who were less experienced, which is a slightly sobering thought. Similar paper showing the same sort of thing with uh, microwave ablation. And um, this paper was an important paper which showed that uh, if you get an insufficient margin, it leads to local tumor progression. This was a large series from uh, Innsbruck. So I think in light of this, Cassination moved towards developing the ablation technology, um, which is where you segment your tumor ablation uh, volume once it's done. This takes seconds to do and you fuse it with your preoperative planned uh, uh, sort of margin and you see where you are. You're able to visualize it in 3D and importantly, you're able to quantify it. This then lets you make a decision there and then whilst the patient is on the table as to whether or not you need to do another ablation. And this is important. It means it's a change for us because for many years we were operating in a fire and forget mode. You put the needle in, you burn and that's it but actually you need to check whether you've burnt, burnt it properly. So this is uh, what it looks like here. So you have the um, system uh, and you fuse your, your ablation zone overlying it. And when you look at what has happened, you can scroll through and you kind of get the impression that you're sort of there. But once you segment the uh, ablation zone, you're able to see the um, a quantitative assessment in terms of this histogram that appears in the bottom right. And what this shows you is a red line and a yellow line and then bars within it. 
So everything should be to the right of the red line as a minimum. That is the tumor. If you have, if you have uh, bars to the left of the red line, it means you haven't covered the tumor. But you can see in this case that a lot of the bars in the histogram are between the red and the yellow line. So this means you've ablated around the tumor, but you have not ablated fully the margin that you were intending to ablate. What you really want is the majority of your bars to be to the right of the yellow line so that you've ablated both tumor and margin. And what the software will enable you to do then is to kind of look at the uh, ablation zone in a 3D um, reconstruction and let you like this and it will show you where you've been short. And you can see it in the bottom left picture and where, where the ablation zone has not covered the margin. And at that point, you should go back and re-ablate. So this type of technology, it sort of represents a bit of a paradigm shift, um, at least for me anyway. I, I was looking at this and I was thinking the things that we know um, and the things that we think we know, do we, are they really true? So for example, for a long time we thought the three centimeter was the limit of what we could do with ablation, but you start to ask yourself why? And the answer is because the results are not as good. And then you ask yourself, well, why? And it's because they get local tumor recurrence. And then you ask yourself again, why? It's because the ablation is incomplete. And it's incomplete because you can't see it or you're not sure where you are. So this now changes everything. So this is one of our cases. It's a four centimeter tumor, HCC, tried to embolize it twice, didn't work. But you're able to plan multiple overlapping trajectories. You can put multiple probes in. Um, you can adjust where you are, um, check where you are in terms of your ablation. And then a year down the line, patient's uh, disease free. So what are we going to see? So that's the castination system in its, um, in its sort of basic format. What are we going to see next? The next generation or the next uh, software update, which is coming imminently, has two main features. The first one is organ seg segmentation, and the second one is an enhanced uh, segmentation process. So the, um, the uh, multi-organ reconstruction, this employs a deep learning uh, technology to not just have the um, sorry, let's play on that. To not just show you the bones that you had in the uh, current generation, but it also now will segment the major structures around the liver and inside the liver. So you will now see the portal vein, you will now see the hepatic veins, you will see the kidneys and the lungs, and this will enable you to better plan your trajectory, and it will also improve the outcomes from when you assess your uh, ablation margin afterwards. The second feature is this improvement in tumor segmentation and in ablation zone segmentation. So currently the uh, system uses uh, um, Hounsfield unit attenuation to kind of decide where the tumor is, but we know tumors are not, uh, not homogeneous. You can have variations in attenuation in and around the tumor. And similarly, with the necrosis uh, segmentation or the ablation assessment zone, uh, that's clearly heterogeneous. We've all seen many cases where you have hematoma at various points inside uh, the ablation zone. So the new version will use, again, a deep learning approach to um, identifying and more accurately representing this, which will only lead to improvements in outcome. Finally, this is a, there's a, another uh, technological advancement which is happening, which is uh, this idea of uh, training mode. It's not training mode for teaching. It's at the moment you go through the CT scan to identify your entry point. But now this is a kind of quality of life improvement where you'll be able to move the pointer and it has a pointer to show you, again, avoiding all those structures where you need to go. So I'm looking forward to that. Beyond that, what's going to come next in 2023 and beyond? Well, we're going to have improved tumor tracking. This will be a nice quality of life improvement because there is the potential to have automatic fusion between MR and CT. And this is a very kind of intriguing prospect to the idea that the software can design or look at all the potential options for which trajectory to choose and identify the best trajectories for you to look at and sort of suggest them to you. 
We'll obviously see improvements in technology in terms of heat sink modeling, and of course, for those that use microwave, everyone will be very familiar with tissue shrinkage modeling and uh, what we need to do with that. So to summarize, the CAS1 IR system provides a solution to many of the traditional challenges that we have expands the range of treatable lesions, including lesions that are difficult to reach, difficult to see, and larger lesions. It streamlines the process of targeting and placement. Critically, it enables intraprocedural assessment of outcome. And it provides a template for reproducibility and standardization, which we struggle with in general terms in interventional oncology. And of course, new AI-driven approaches will further refine and iterate the process. Thank you. Thank you. It was really an outstanding, very clear presentation, and uh, the future is really interesting mm. for, for the system. There is, a, for now, a question from the audience. Was the training data set for the deep learning approach diverse enough to work on data from various CT scanners or even different patient demographics? Yes, so the deep land, uh, the training set was uh, more than a thousand cases, multiple centers, multiple CTs, uh, scanners, so it took all of that into account. It's really, really a good question. There are sometimes problems with different CT scanners, so the system is trained uh, well enough to, to deal with that. So uh, just a quick uh, comment, please, on the need of GA, general anesthesia, in yeah. these procedures. We've always done all of our liver ablations with uh, GA, and uh, I think you need it because of the uh, motion variability and um, during the procedure. Because it's a stereotactic system, it minimizes uh, what you, you know the movement. You, you can't have the patient. So with moving. GA, yeah. with general anesthesia, we are able to compensate the yeah. respiratory moving and to do it. Yeah, exactly.